Cork. For almost as long as there has been wine, cork has been used to seal the bottle. This ancient tradition and the ecosystem that it supports faced mounting challenges as competitors emerged. In recent years, a picture-perfect industry thought to be untouchable was suddenly threatened. Cork producers needed to rethink everything they knew, from bark to bottle, to save their industry. In 3000 BC, cork stripped from trees was used in fishing tackle in China, Egypt, Babylon, and Persia. The Greeks used cork to close wine jugs, and the Romans used cork for floats, cask stoppers, and women's footwear. In the 17th century, the French Benedictine monk, Dom Perignon, used cork to seal bottles of his famous champagne. And in the 18th century, cork stoppers began being used in the wine trade in Portugal. Since 1870, one company, Amarim, has been at the center of this industry. The path from the forests through the factories is quite simple. Men come here in pair of two, usually in groups of 20 to 30 men, and they take the cork with an axe. Two men work with uh, the same tree, and it's like building a suit. And then with the back of the axe, there's a wedge, that they pull inside of the cork, between the trunk and the cork, and they just peel it off. And then afterwards, the cork is boiled in water to, to change it to be more softened and to increase the, the size of the cells. Then the corks go directly into the production, where they are cut in what we call strips, and then those strips are punched, and you get the natural cork. Amarim has grown to a billion-dollar business, employing more than 3,000 people. But the cork industry has been challenged by contamination, competition, costs, and evolving consumer attitudes. The pressure on the cork industry built and even included a mock funeral held in New York's Grand Central Terminal. The event, staged by a California winemaker, was meant to signal the end of an era. A wonderful winemaker and a true genius in the wine world named Randall Graham, who owned a winery called Bonnie Doom out in California, uh, decided to uh, conduct a funeral for corks. My name is Randall Graham, and I approve this message. A votre santé. Randall Graham is a great gatherer of publicity. Uh, his funeral for old cork certainly gave a, a lot of publicity to it. And I think from that point of view, it was effective because it got a lot of people thinking about it. He was definitely wrong. He was definitely wrong in assuming that cork um, was going to die. Graham was convinced that screw caps were the future. More than 99% of the wine bottles his vineyard produces are now sealed this way. The battle moved to the internet with the help of social media. For example, Bonnie Doon's viral marketing campaign titled Viva le screw cap. The cork est mort. Viva le screw cap. Graham, along with other winemakers, was concerned with contamination from cork, also known as taint. He made a particular chemical the centerpiece of his campaign. A compound called 246-trichloroanisole, or TCA. It's a common belief that it's a reaction between um, the chlorine bleaching agent that's used to purify a cork and wine. We've seen it in the dining room many, many times where um, you know you pull the cork on a a very expensive bottle of wine and it's tainted and it's, uh, it's sad. Cork sometimes adds some diseases to 
the wine and uh, screw cap doesn't. The taint question led to the rise of another competitor, mass-producible and very inexpensive synthetic stoppers. Since its launch in 1999, one producer of synthetic closures, North Carolina-based Nomacork, has become a major force in the industry. Well, Nomacork sells about 2.4 billion corks per year uh, across the globe. And uh, the company, which was established about 12 years ago, has seen double-digit growth in 10 of those 12 years. So it's a fast-growing uh, company that's grown to be a pretty sizable player in the market. According to the Wall Street Journal, in just the past decade, Cork lost about 20% of its market to cheaper plastic stoppers. Another 11% was taken by screw caps. Nobody in the wine industry is there to sell corks. People are there to sell wine. When I go to the grocery store to buy a bottle of wine, I'm not buying a Noma cork or a cork or a screw cap. I'm buying a Cote de Rhone from France or a Shiraz from Australia. All of our wines use cork, of course, uh, because of our quality of uh, the wines, we think there's no other possible uh, uh, stopper for uh, our wines. When the dust settle, we ought to thank the plastics and we ought to thank the screw caps for that proverbial kick in the pants that we got, because uh, sooner or later we would have done it, but I'm pretty sure we would not have done it so quickly and so decisively. You know what, for someone that it's dead and buried, as uh, we were, I think we uh, quite doing quite well. The cork industry fought back and hit its competitors head on, working to improve its quality, restore its image, and build new markets. TCA is omnipresent, it's an innocuous but omnipresent compound, so we needed to deal with that. And we did. We paid the price for that. We paid a heavy price. The industry lost about a third of the market. And that is not just some abstract number. That translates into real jobs, real people, real trees, real areas of cork, industry, of cork forests that were, were lost. So we, we acted and we invested the money that was necessary. So we started developing certification techniques. We started to develop uh, research and development uh, teams inside the industry and in partnership with some wine uh, research centers uh, around the world. And we started to invest in new technologies, in new quality control mechanisms that today allow us to say that TCA is something that is uh, already part uh, of the past. There is so much that changed in the way a quark stopper is produced. All that process from bark to bottle changed dramatically and it changed in, in little ways and it changed in big ways. I have the privilege to work in an industry where nothing is lost, so you don't have what you call waste in this industry. Uh, what, we can, what we would consider waste after, because we are really talking here about the premium products of this raw material. Actually, it's the ultimate sustainable uh, raw material that you can think of, in the sense that we don't even cut the trees down, for starters. And on top of that, there is a major uh, triple bottom line benefit here. We talk about social benefits, economic benefits, and environmental benefits. Environmental groups began working with cork producers to certify forests managed with wildlife in mind. The industry is paying a premium for certified cork. So if the landowner complies with management that is good for biodiversity conservation, conservation and if he managed to produce this, the cork in that way, you'll be getting a, a premium for the cork he's producing. This is a certified forest. It's because it's managed in a way that it's right in the economic point, but also in the environmental and social point. In terms of the environmental uh, role of these several kinds of stoppers, the cork is the best one. It's protecting a forest that is preserving uh, uh, ecosystem flora and fauna. We are researching at the moment the use of cork for multiple things, from uh, the aerospace industry, for uh, mobility, to lower uh, the weight of uh, every transportation that you can think of and have acoustic properties and have green properties and have antivibratic properties. A real revolution took place in the way cork was handled, in the way cork was stored, in the way cork was produced, and certainly in the way that the quality control was done. That revolution really laid the ground to uh, arrive where we are today. All these processes that we have, we have made them being validated in 
wine research centers, wine specialists, the wine universities. Uh, and I think that today we are clearly far beyond the level of uh, knowledge uh, that we were uh, uh, 12 years ago. In the late 2000s, Amarim wielded a new weapon to defend the age-old traditions surrounding cork, an internet campaign featuring the comedian Rob Schneider. Imagine going into a fancy French restaurant. Uh, Monsieur, Mademoiselle, we have a beautiful burgundy. Uh, please, uh, let me unscrew this for you. Cork, it's just, it's more romantic, it's better. The beauty of the internet is that it allows us, with relatively low budget, to do things that otherwise would be completely out of our reach. The Save Miguel campaign is a wonderful example of that. There's a ritual to wine, there's a history to it. People like the ritual. And as much as the plastic people or the screw cap people have tried, they've never been able to match that ritual. And there's something special about that when you um, put your corkscrew in and you twist it and you pull it out and it makes this beautiful pop noise. And, and that's part of this wonderful romance of the, of the process of, of drinking a bottle of wine. And uh, it's not quite the same when you hear the twist off cap. I can never imagine that some guy is going to ask the, the love of his life to marry him over dinner some night when they had a bottle with a screw cap in it. There's a saying in this region where we are here in Portugal that if you want to make money for yourself, you plant an eucalyptus. You want to make money for your children, you plant a pine tree. But you want to make money for your grandchildren, you plant a cork oak. We want to have a chance to tell this unique story because when consumers know the story behind Cork, when consumers realize what is at stake, then they definitely prefer and they exercise that preference for Cork. The battle behind the bottle has produced a clear winner, but it's not Cork, plastic, or the screw cap. The winner is the consumer, who now, thanks to this burst of competition and innovation, can choose wines with more confidence and a much clearer sense of the story behind each stopper.